Good morning, everyone. We'll get started. I am Chris Goodwin with the Mississippi Department of Archives and History. Welcome to this week's History is Lunch program, which is sponsored by the John and Lucy Shackelford Charitable Fund of the Community Foundation for Mississippi. We're in the Craig H. Nielsen Auditorium in the Museum of Mississippi History and Mississippi Civil Rights Museum. And if you've not already done so, please silence your cell phones. Celebrate Historic Preservation Month with us at the Archaeology Expo this Saturday, May 29th from 10 a.m. to 2 p.m. on the grounds of the Old Capitol Museum. There will be a hands-on digging and excavation site, atlatl javelin and flint napping demonstrations, and more. You can find those details on Facebook. And then join us next week for History's Lunch when the Reverend C.J. Rhodes will present the history of Mount Helm Baptist Church and the future of black religion. We're delighted to have Steve Pfeiffer and Denise Morse with us today to, prevent, to present C.T. Vivian in Words and Deeds. Mayor Shokwe Antar Lumumba has proclaimed this C.T. Vivian Day in Jackson, and I'd like to bring to the stage Ms. Morse and First Lady Ebony Lumumba to say a few words about that. Dr. Lumumba is chair of the English department at Jackson State University and a longtime friend of the department dating to her time as the 2013 Eudora Welty Fellow. Good afternoon. It's a pleasure to be in the room with people, something I never thought we'd have to <laughs> distinguish, but it feels good, right? I'm excited, I'm heartened to be here today uh, to publicly and personally thank Ms. Denise Morris for being so diligent and so courageous about purveying your father's legacy, your family's legacy, and allowing us to honor your family and your father here in Jackson. It's important, I believe, for posterity. As a poetic note, I want to point out that 60 years ago, this week, it was actually May 24th, 1961, Reverend Dr. C.T. Vivian boarded a bus with other Freedom Riders headed to our city, Jackson, Mississippi. And I think I'll take a point of privilege in pointing out it was a very different city in 1961, considering the aims and the goals of the space. Also in 1961, President Barack Obama was born. Can you believe that? And I think that's significant because we fast forward almost 50 years later to see Reverend Vivian receive the Presidential Medal of Honor from President Obama. Just one of the many poetic moments of Reverend Vivian's life. He is an eternal inspiration to me, Reverend Vivian. Because in 1961, he represented one of the older riders in the Freedom Ride, but he was only a few years younger than I am now. For me, this demonstrated the necessity and effectiveness of intergenerational commitment and struggle. Reverend Vivian remains as a source of inspiration for leaders and advocates for justice at every age. His life teaches us that among other things, we are never too young, never too old, never too inexperienced to be on the front lines of this battle for justice. So I'm truly grateful to be here on behalf of my family, my husband, Mayor Lumumba, and our city to welcome the legacy of this great man into the annals of our city's story. As a literature professor, I am keenly aware of the importance of producing and purveying correct and honest history and narratives. This wonderful book, that you all have the opportunity, I believe, to purchase and have signed. Little commercial. This wonderful book, I believe, contributes to this aim in my own work and our dedication as a city to speak truth and to ensure that our children are clear on where we have been as well as where we're going. I'll take another point of privilege here to note that uh, one of the most remarkable moments in this book, and there are many, was when Reverend Vivian revealed that Attorney General Bobby Kennedy and then Governor Ross Barnett struck a deal for the Freedom Riders to be protected by the National Guard and the state uh, troopers, but that they would be arrested here in Jackson, Mississippi. That was the deal struck by then Attorney General and Mississippi Governor, and they hoped that it would quell any other rides 
And what we saw is that as they arrested those young people and jailed them at parchment for up to two weeks, that it did just the opposite. It ignited a movement. And we are grateful to hopefully resist that kind of happening and that sort of history moving forward. And that story in itself, that moment in itself in this book, corrects the revisionist history that there was some sort of protection for the freedom riders here in Mississippi. They were being led as sheep to the slaughter, but they were seeds that planted this sort of dedication to justice. So we look forward to embedding this type of history in courses all over our city in an effort to plant similar seeds of justice to that of the life of Reverend Vivian. So today, 60 years later, I want to welcome Reverend Dr. Vivian's legacy, his story, his family, to this city in a manner that is quite opposite of his reception into Jackson, Mississippi in 1961. Let it be known that Reverend Vivian is not only welcome here, but that he is a part of us. To cement that, it is my extreme honor to present to Ms. Denise Morse, the eldest daughter of Octavia and C.T. Vivian, with this proclamation from the city of Jackson that declares today, Reverend C.T. Vivian Day in our city. I think that deserves a hand. Before I present this document to Ms. Morse, I'd like to read just a couple of excerpts from it. Whereas Reverend Vivian's efforts brought him to Mississippi as a freedom writer in 1961, and as an organizer of the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee, or SNCC, the Summer Project for Voter Registration in 1964, and whereas his devotion to civil rights extended nearly his entire lifetime from 1924 to 2020, including playing leadership roles in Nashville, Birmingham, St. Augustine, and Selma, and of course, Jackson, Mississippi, where C.T. Vivian was arrested during the Freedom Rides and jailed and beaten at Mississippi State Penitentiary, also known as Parchman Farm. And whereas Reverend C.T. Vivian's image is captured in Gallery 5 of, Miss of the Mississippi Civil Rights Museum, much of his life has been dedicated to voting rights and bringing social justice to the forefront. Now, therefore, I, Shokwe Antar Lumumba, do hereby recognize Reverend Cordy Tyndall Vivian for the bravery and the sacrifice that he has made throughout his life. I would like to thank him for his commitment in being a nonviolent warrior in his pursuit of racial equality. Therefore, we are proud to name May 26, 2021 as C.T. Vivian Day in Jackson, Mississippi, given under my husband's hand and the seal of Jackson, Mississippi on today's date. Ms. Morris. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Steve Pfeiffer will join us via Zoom on screen here, and we'll bring Ms. Morse back up in a few moments. Uh, Steve Pfeiffer is the author of more than a dozen nonfiction books, including Jimmy Lee and James, Two Lives, Two Deaths, and The Movement That Changed America, and award-winning collaborations with Southern Poverty Law Center founder Morris Dees, human rights activist Dr. Quentin Young, and former Secretary of State James Baker. A Guggenheim Fellowship winner, Pfeiffer is a graduate of Yale University and the University of Chicago Law School. Denise Morse is one of the six living children of C.T. and Octavia Vivian. She serves as treasurer of the C.T. and Octavia Vivian Museum and Archives, where she is responsible for guiding outreach programs based on the life and legacy of her parents. 
Morris earned a BA from Clark College and an MBA from Atlanta University. We'll start this portion of the program with a video of Reverend Vivian in Selma, Alabama, and then we'll bring Steve and Denise on live. You can't keep anyone in the United States from voting without hurting the rights of all other citizens. Democracy's built on this. This is why every man has the right to vote, regardless. Is what I'm saying true? Yeah. Is it what you think and what you believe? Yeah. Move back. If we're wrong, why don't you arrest us? We're willing to be beaten for democracy. You beat people's body in order that they will not have the privilege to vote. It is uh, such an honor for me uh, to be able to introduce a true statesman who has devoted his life serving God and all of humanity through his signature focus. Steve, can you hear us? Yes. It's all you. Well, thank you very much. Thank you, Chris. And thank you to the city of Jackson and Mayor Lumumba and Professor Lumumba for those lovely and wonderful remarks. You really captured uh, Dr. Vivian. And it's just an honor to have heard those words. And it's an honor to be sharing the stage with Denise, who was so instrumental in helping me uh, bring this book to to the public. Uh, I'd like to start the presentation with that video of Dr. Vivian in Selma because, first of all, it's an incredibly iconic moment, an important moment in the history of the civil rights movement. Fortunately, it was captured on film by the national news networks and broadcast to the North and to Washington, D.C., where legislators were considering voting rights legislation, and it had a huge impact on the passage of the Voting Rights Act. Andrew Young said if that moment hadn't been captured on film, if Dr. Vivian hadn't approached Jim Clark in the way he had, that there might not even have been the passage of a Voting Rights Act. So it's a really significant uh, moment in our nation's history. And I also like to show it because it's what brought me together with Dr. Vivian on what I consider the most important and meaningful uh, professional experience I've ever had. Uh, I was writing a book called Jimmy Lee and James, Two Lives, Two Deaths, and the Movement that Changed America back in 2014. And that was about Jimmy Lee Jackson, an African-American farmer from Marion, Alabama, and Reverend James Reeve, a white Unitarian minister from up north, both of whom were foot soldiers in the movement and both of whom had lost their lives a uh, few weeks apart from each other in the effort for voting rights. And Dr. Vivian had been so involved in that effort himself in Selma uh, and had actually uh, spoken 
to the assembled in a church in Marion, Alabama, the night Jimmy Lee Jackson was shot by a white state trooper, that I wanted to get Dr. Vivian's take on what had been going on in the movement at this time. And so I called him up in Atlanta and we really hit it off. He called me Doc and I thought, boy, that's really special. Then I learned he called everybody Doc because he didn't remember everybody's name. So it wasn't quite as special as I, as I thought. But uh, we, he said he wanted to be a journalist. And I said, oh, I'm so glad that you did what you did and changed the world through, through your actions in the movement. Uh, but that led to us deciding to work on the book because I said to him, I don't think you've ever written a story of your of your life. You're 90 years old now and you've led such an incredible life. And he was such a humble man and also uh, a man who'd been so busy that he really hadn't taken the time to sit down and, and work on, on a book. So that's how the book materialized. And I'm just so happy we had the opportunity to do it. And one of the, the most uh, telling and I think important uh, discussions we had was actually about the moment that you saw on, on film there. And I think it, it really summarizes both Dr. Vivian and the movement at that time. So I'd just like to take a moment to, uh, to read a, a brief passage. And these are obviously his words. And it was when I asked him uh, how he was able to react in the way he did after Sheriff Clark pushed him down the steps on the uh, day in February of 1965. He said, it becomes very clear that we can never allow evil to destroy the forces of righteousness, even when beaten down. I had to get back up because otherwise people would have been defeated by violence. We can never allow violence to defeat nonviolence. There can be no questions unanswered. The depth of the human consciousness must be told. With Jim Clark, it was a clear engagement between the forces of the movement and the forces of the structure that would destroy the movement. It was a clear engagement between those who wished the fullness of their personalities to be met and those that would destroy us physically and psychologically. You do not walk away from that. That is what movement meant. Movement meant that we were finally encountering on a mass scale the evil that had been destroying us on a mass scale. You do not walk away from that. You continue to answer it. It does not matter whether you are beaten. That's a secondary matter. The only important thing is that you reach the conscience of those who are with you and of anyone watching, both the so-called enemy and those who are preparing the battle and anyone else who may be watching. And uh, I've discussed that passage with uh, the Vivian family uh, Al Vivian, uh, the youngest son, and Denise, who's here today. And I wanted to ask Denise what she remembered of that time period. Uh, Selma, uh, she was about, I think, nine years old at that time, obviously a little, little younger uh, during the Freedom Rides. But Denise, kind of, can you share what, what you remember from those, from those days? Well, um, being fairly young, I think I was maybe 11 when the Selma incident happened, and when he was here in Jackson, I was six. So uh, I don't remember a lot about it, simply because our mother protected us. I mean, she didn't allow us to watch the evening news. She, she, uh, she and Dad never discussed, really, movement in front of us. Um, what I would say I remembered was that mom was usually stressed. <laughs> she would try her best not to show it, but uh, I mean, that was the time when Martin's house was bombed, when um, uh, 
you know, so many people did lose their lives. So what I remember was her sitting in the window all night. If you got up in the middle of the night to use the bathroom, if you looked down the hall, and we lived in a small house, you could see mom sitting in the front window. She slept during the day when we went to school, and at night she watched the house. That's the kind of thing I remember. Um, Dad was gone during the week. Uh, he was from city to city to city, and he would come home on the weekend uh, because he did have a church in Chattanooga and Nashville, which were those early years. And uh, he would come home and preach on the weekend. I remember him preparing a sermon. He'd fly in on Friday night or Saturday, prepare a sermon, and Monday he was gone. So we knew there was something going on, but it was just normal life for us. Um, people called the house all the time. Um, uh, I guess the wives keeping each other informed, and you know, you you would remember that. But otherwise, we were. I was pretty young. The women of the movement, the, the wives and yeah. uh, the the women that were on the front lines, played such an important role in in the movement that I think is underappreciated. Can you can you talk a little about you know the role of 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 the women? During those times, I know your dad, when we spoke, said that he considered your mom a total partner in everything he did. And he never did anything without consulting her first, whether it be going to seminary after uh, God spoke to him when he was in uh, Peoria in the early 1950s, or whether it was going on these freedom rides. We talked about the fact that he talked to your mom about uh, about whether or not he should actually go uh, on the, the second wave of freedom rides, especially after what had happened to the, the first group of, of freedom riders. Uh, some people don't realize that he was a dozen or more years older than most of the other uh, freedom riders, as, as Dr. Lumumba pointed out. Uh, that uh, he had gone to seminary at American Baptist Theological Seminary uh, a lot uh, when he was a lot older than, than the others who were there in Nashville at the time. And so he actually had a fan, I mean, the commitment <laughs> and the, everybody putting their lives on the line uh, during the Freedom Ride and the rest of the movement, no matter how old or, or young they were, was incredible. But your dad, being older, actually had a family uh, at home, young children, and so the stakes were, in a sense, a little higher for him if something did happen, and, and your mom was such a partner in, in this. Can you just talk a little about, about uh, the role that all the women were playing during this time period? Well, your comment brings a lot of things to mind. Um, one story, dad, my dad loved women. He respected women, and, um, uh, and he had four daughters. And uh, uh, he, um, I remember one story they told, uh, mom and dad would tell, was, uh, or dad told it mostly. Um, I was, oh, um, he came home, he had gotten the, the uh, uh, Jehovah God told him, I, go to seminary, you, you are supposed to be a, a minister. And um, he, had, he was a student at Western uh, Illinois, and he was married, and he comes home to tell mom that this, um, he's been inspired to go to seminary and what do you think about it? And she said, well, first I have something to tell you. <laughs> and she told him she was pregnant with me and the first child. And uh, he said, oh. And he, she says, so what do you want to tell me? You know, he was excited about it, but he said, oh, no, that's all right. And she said, no, I want to hear what you wanted to tell me. And what he wanted to tell her was he wanted to go to seminary. And he wanted to go to somebody, uh, an employer that he had was going to give him a scholarship to go, was going to pay for him to go. But that didn't mean wife and child. <laughs> and um, he said they were laying in bed that night, and he, he said, you know, maybe I won't go. And she said, so whose faith is in question right now? And so he, he, uh, he said, you know, I, I knew then that I was going to seminary and I knew I was probably going without my wife, and he did. And um, uh, he went to Nashville, and that is where he met John Lewis, who was probably 19, I'm guessing, somewhere in, in uh, uh, 
the, the other people at American Baptist College who, uh, Bevel, Bernard Lafayette, I mean, it just goes on and on. They all were young, and he, here he is 30-some years old <laughs> with a family. He was probably 32 when he got there. Um, there were so many women in the movement who sacrificed. I mean, you have Fannie Lou Hamer, who you all know, but uh, and then uh, Zenona Clayton, who was, uh, just goes on and on. There were women who actually marched and suffered and were beaten and so forth, and we didn't hear much about them because it was a man's world in the 50s and 60s. I mean, women just weren't pushed forward. But, uh, and then the young students who marched. Uh, but then you had the wives of the movement men. They, they, eventually, they all had wives. There was Coretta King, there was Hosea's wife, there was my, my mother. And they really, um, not only did they fight battles locally, uh, like my mom helped open up a community, a uh, segregated community in Atlanta when we lived there, but uh, while dad was gone. But they really kept the men going. I mean, not only did they take care of the family, but they were sort of the communication system too. Uh, I mean, the phone would ring and it was Ab's wife or it'd be, you know, Hosea's wife. They all kept each other informed. So if they heard from their husband, they would call and let the other wives know that where their men were, because a lot of times they didn't know. Uh, so they were all involved and they all had to step out there on faith that they'd actually get their husbands back home. And that occurred to me today when uh, I heard someone say, when, well, when um, uh, your mayor just announced that this was, it was uh, uh, 60 years ago this month that dad was here. Well, at the time, my mother was pregnant with my youngest brother. So here he is, and I, I had never stopped to think about that, but here he is at Parchman Prison, and mom's got five kids at home and one more on the way. So um, they were pretty courageous women, and for the most part, they were, um, you know, women. My mother was a social worker. She couldn't work as one. She had too many kids, but, you know, they, they uh, uh, in, a, in a time where most women at home didn't, you know, stay at home, but... Uh, they were women who were also accomplished and had also achieved things, but um, they were um, brave and, and um, did without a lot so that their husbands could be out and, and you know, out working and um, making it better for, for us, for children, for black children. You know, you, you mentioned Parchman, Denise, and we have a lengthy section about uh, your dad at Parchman there, uh, some of the things just to, to point out. Uh, he shared a cell with uh, Bernard Lafayette, who we've already talked about as being quite a bit younger, and, and Dr. Lafayette has said that it's not every day you get to be locked up with one of your teachers. Uh, they also managed through a kind of a Morse code system to be able to actually hold uh, religious services by tapping on the walls with each other, which really uh, was was amazing. And your dad told me that that he had one of his real religious experiences when he was at Parchman, when he was both beaten and then actually had a gun put in right. his mouth by a guard who just was taunting him asking him, do you have syphilis? Just the, the abuse that, that these people took, both physically and psychologically, was just incredible. And I, I, I think that it, it goes back to Nashville in, uh, in understanding how Dr. Vivian and the others in the movement were able to pick themselves up after being pushed down by the Jim Clarks or hosed by the Bull Connors or uh, beaten wherever they were on the, on the Freedom Rides yeah. and, and not react as many of us might by trying to protect ourselves physically. And that all goes back to, to Nashville where James Lawson was running workshops uh, teaching nonviolent direct action to a group, a remarkable group of, of people, 
uh, that included some of the names you've already mentioned, Denise, uh, uh, Bernard Lafayette, John Lewis, Marion Barry, Diane mm -hmm. Nash, some were at Fisk, some were at American Baptist, some were at uh, Tennessee A&I, mm -hmm. and they were trained uh, to respond nonviolently to all the abuses that they knew they were going to uh, be exposed to when they actually were out on the streets. Uh, Dr. Lawson had studied uh, in India and had learned the techniques of Gandhi. So they actually, in these workshops, would have these exercises where they would actually put out burning cigarettes on each other and learn not to respond in a, in a violent or physical way to, to that and they push each other around, and, and it, it's, it's just amazing how they were able to take that training out onto the, onto the streets. And it really was the action that they took to the streets that was so important, and that's why we called the book it's in the action. A uh, little confession. I initially uh, wanted to call the book Happy to be Miserable. Uh, Dr. Vivian had, had told me that uh, when they were in the movement that uh, they were making lives miserable for the white power establishment gladly making lives miserable for the white power establishment. And he said, we were miserable too, but we were happy to be miserable. And in, in, that's a little to me like John, John Lewis is, you know, making good trouble. And so I proposed that title to the family, but they were very adamant about the title being it's in the action. And I'm glad they were. Denise, you want to Tell us why It's in the Action was, was so important to both uh, being the title and, and also to the way your dad lived his yeah. life. Yeah, gladly. Um, dad used to say it's in the action that you find out who you are. And um, that's what he did. He took action. His, his view was do something. If you see something wrong, don't stand there. Do something about it. Um, I mean, he um, started, he actually, most people don't know, he developed a prototype for Upward Bound, and the government took it over after that, but, and changed the name, he called it Vision, but he started that, so, because he saw that, okay, we're out here fighting to hopefully get our people jobs, and we've got young people out here marching every day, they're out of school, some of them are being put out of school, because they're marching, they've got to find a way to get an education, and, or to bolster their education, so he started Upward Bound. Uh, I think it was in Alabama. And um, he, uh, the, because the black church was so involved in the movement, uh, and really, if you think about it, most of the leaders were pastors. Uh, he started the Urban Training Center. He wanted to train young people and uh, those going into the ministry on nonviolent activity and how do you organize to make things happen. So he started the Black Action and Strategies and Information. Well, no, that was uh, the wrong one. Uh, um, uh, he started an organization. Which one was it in Chicago? I'm, the brain's going, Steve. No, uh, UGC. Yeah. yeah Urban yeah. Training Center. Urban Training Center, thank you. That's which got us to Chicago. And then in Chicago, he sees that the gangs are fighting each other. You've got the um, three or four different gangs in the city all killing each other. And he said, well, they need jobs. So he forced the train, um, the, uh, the mayor, Mayor Daly, and the trades union to allow blacks. That was a two-year fight. Uh, black men into the trades union. So he saw a problem where they can't, you can't be an electrician, you're not, you can't be a carpenter. I mean, you can, but you can't do it in a union. So he forced the unions to accept uh, blacks into the trades. And then he sees, well, we've got uh, ministers who need to be trained, but they can't afford to come to the training center, so let's start um, uh, uh, and uh, what, what would it be, a remote training Seminary system. Without Seminary walls. Seminary without yeah. walls. I, in fact, I think it was maybe the first of the schools uh, without walls. There were a lot of them after that, where ministers could be trained 
uh, remotely uh, through tapes and things. So we had famous theologians giving um, sermons and training, and they could, people could learn throughout the country. And that got us to North Carolina at Shaw University. So no matter where he was, uh, he saw a problem, and he did something. So that's where it's in the action came from. You know, he, he, he uh, yeah, go ahead. Uh, well, I wanted to add the uh, anti-Klan network yep. to fight white supremacy in the late 70s, one of the first organizations to do that. Uh, again, thinking way ahead of his time and then in, in creating uh, the business, BASIC, which was really the first and remains the foremost uh, companies that uh, trains uh, or works with corporations and not-for-profits mm -hmm. and, and the government in uh, issues of diversity yeah. and inclusion. So he, he was a man definitely ahead of his time with his action. And one of uh, the kind of prized possessions that I have here at home now uh, from you is a copy of one of the sermons that your dad gave where almost on every page in the margins he's written, it's in the action, it's in the action to remind himself to uh, tell those uh, to whom he was speaking that uh, words weren't enough, uh, thoughts weren't enough, that you really did have to, have to put that into action. At the same time, uh, Dr. Vivian was a man of, of words and he embraced education and reading and literature. And I don't know if all of you know, but he amassed an incredible collection of works of uh, African-American writers, both fiction and nonfiction, dating back to uh, colonial times. Uh, maybe you could talk a little about your dad's and your mom's love of books and, and the collection, Denise, and, and what's gonna happen to it. Well, um, Dad was an English major, by the way, the grad, and he uh, loved reading. He'd been reading since he was, you know, three or four. He just, his mother, um, in fact, one of the stories I love, there's a book called Men of Mark, and um, he said he was a, a child, and it's, the book's this thick. Dad had a couple of copies, but I mean, it dates back to the probably 1920s, maybe. and. Um, he said his mother handed it to him when he was a child. Now, it might have been his grandmother. Steve, you'd remember better than me. Yeah, uh, grandmother. Grandmother. Uh, he lived with both of them. He lived with his mom and grandmother, raised him. And uh, he said, when she handed it to him, she said, here's CT. And she said, read this. You know, you might like this book. And he said there was a twinkle in her eye. And he said he knew she was saying to him, the book was about... Uh, black men who have um, overcome, uh, nobody overcame it, but who um, survived and, and found their way even in spite of segregation and hate and racism in this country. They were men of mark, men who achieved something. Uh, and he said, I knew when she handed it to me, she was telling me, I expect you to be one of these men. Um, he always read, uh, he spent as much time as he could in the public libraries. He said he used to sneak in and hide up in the stacks and read. So he was very, he, he loved education. And um, he and mom, uh, so we always had books around the house, but once mom and dad got rid of all six of us, we were gone and out of the house, they would uh, uh, head across country. They just go from Maine to California, he'd spend a, be gone a month and come back with a car loaded full of books. They just hit every bookstore they could find. And uh, then he, he knew a lot of book dealers and uh, they all knew he was looking for old books. And his goal was to amass a library um, of uh, books written by African Americans. And so uh, he's got one, the first woman, as I, I could be wrong, but I think I'm right, the first woman to write a book in America or publish a book uh, in America was a former slave, Phyllis Wheatley. And uh, he has a copy of her book, it's 1730 something, I don't know, it's way, way back. It's, it's um, in beautiful condition. 
And then he has lots of books from the late 1700s, 1800s, and so forth. Um, some signed, some not. Uh, Langston Hughes books that are signed. So he just collected books, and they would just go find them in little bookstores, and that was sort of their hobby. Um, and uh, when he passed, uh, he had amassed 6,000 books. Really way more, but we kind of weeded out the duplicates and, and uh, um, took six people about three months to literally um, go through the books and, and categorize them. And um, right now they're in storage, <laughs> but we're hoping. There were 260 boxes of books, uh, if I recall. And um, there's to be a library in his name in Atlanta. Assuming we've been working on this five years, we'll see if it ever really happens, but that's our prayer, is that uh, Rodney Cook Park has just been finished by the city, and we're hoping to come up with the funds to put the books uh, in the library. And some of them are very, very rare. Um, so they, you know, of course, would be on display. It's quite an interesting hobby. Uh, he loved art. Uh, and. Um, he collected a lot of African-American art. Um, he was only able to do all that late in life, uh, maybe in his 70s and, and 80s, but that's kind of what he and mom spent their time doing, um, besides speaking. Yeah. Well, one of the things that uh, the family and myself have been trying to do is to perpetuate that uh, that legacy, that that love of words, and uh, the idea that uh, the younger you are and the earlier you are exposed to stories about men and women of Mark, uh, the more the greater the possibility that you yourself might become a man or a woman of Mark uh, as you grow older. So what we have been doing over the last uh, several weeks is uh, giving copies of the book to graduating seniors in many of the cities that Dr. Vivian either lived in or had a major influence in. So all the graduating high school seniors in Boonville, Missouri, where he grew, where he was born, have received a copy of the book. Uh, similarly, in Selma and in Macomb, where he lived for his early years, and in uh, let's see, Nashville, Nashville, and uh, so we're continuing that and. You know, the school year's over now, but we're really hoping that uh, next year we'll be able to do it in places like Jackson, St. Augustine, and uh, Birmingham, and other cities to be able to give young people this book. And also, great news, there's a curriculum being developed about Dr. Vivian and his life that uh, we're hoping will be... Uh, in colleges and universities within the next uh, six months or a year. Uh, again, just so everybody can know about this wonderful man, I actually believe that it, through him more than any other figure, we can really understand the 20th century civil rights movement because of the fact that he was older than some of the uh, other major uh, figures in the movement, uh, his beginnings in the movement start in the 1940s with attempting to integrate downtown Peoria, the restaurants and lunch counters there, and then continuing all the way up, not just to Selma, but as Denise said, coming up north when he realized that was the major battleground and, and doing all the other remarkable things that he did. So perpetuating his legacy through this book is is just uh, is wonderful. My wife Sharon, who's a novelist, says there are only two reasons to write a book: to save a life or to change the world. And while a lot has changed since the 1960s, the book makes clear that that we really still have a long way to go, 
particularly with the voting, the voting rights battle. So we're really hoping the book leads to a discussion about voter suppression, the role of the church, nonviolent direct action. And I, I really believe that though he's gone, his words can continue to change the world. Let's hope so. Um, the world needs a lot of changing. <laughs> yeah. But, um, you know, that's, Daddy was always in the moment. He cared about now, you know, what, what's going on now, what's changing now. And um, that's what was so wonderful about him. Um, you know, a lot of um, pastors preach about the hereafter and you're going to heaven and all that. He was concerned about fixing this right here. And that's what made his preaching um, so special was that he could take a story from the gospel and turn it into reality right here today. This is, here's the same comparison. You know, God talked about it here. He told you about it here, but it applies right here. And that's what was so wonderful about him. I don't know if I'm getting off subject, but, but that was the, the thing yeah. is that um, the book, the things that Steve is, is um, uh, put into his pen actually should hopefully help people understand what else needs to be done. It gives you an idea of what makes a person think the way he thought and to then take action. And, um, and I just thank you for the book. It's, it's been really, uh, taught me a lot too. <laughs> I, he raised me, but I learned lots more from the book. <laughs> And uh, hopefully young people will read it. That's, that's my hope. People need to know what makes a person strong enough to stand up for what's right and to try and make a change in this world. Yeah. Absolutely. Chris, did you want to take some time for some questions? Yeah, I think this is a perfect time to go to questions from the audience. If you have a question, raise your hand. I'll bring you the microphone and you can ask it. I'll tell you what, I'm gonna ask one before I see a hand go up then. Could you tell us a little bit about your mother's relationship with Coretta Scott King and the book that oh, came yeah. about? Well, of course the, the women, the wives of the movement were very close. Uh, but my mother loved Coretta King. Um, she respected her. Um, I mean, Coretta truly is one of those women who did sacrifice her husband. And I think she always knew that there would be a time, they all knew there would be a time when Martin King would make it. Uh, but mom loved Coretta and she wrote the first biography of Coretta. I think I was 15 maybe when the book came out. Uh, she wrote the first biography of Coretta King. There have been others. Um, and uh, my mother actually was a writer uh, and an archivist. She, she uh, kept records of everything from the movement, newspaper articles, magazine articles, books, um, handwritten things that she um, acquired, posters. I think we found maybe 100 posters from the movement and the, uh, the stuffed in a closet. I mean, she just kept everything. And, um, she kept information on, on all of the leaders of the movement, and one of them was Coretta, and uh, they had a long and lasting relationship. She helped her when, uh, when Coretta decided to um, uh, open the King Center after Martin was uh, murdered, um, uh, Mom asked her to help, and, uh, because Mom was a, a writer and, and uh, an archivist, so they were very close. Yeah, she was a lovely person. There's a, a chapter in the book that uh, Dr. Vivian had written previously about uh, Dr. King being a prophet and a 21st century yeah. man. And uh, it both uh, demonstrates uh, Dr. Vivian's love and respect for, for Dr. King and also his Dr. Vivian's uh, wonderful writing ability. Yeah, um, I, I remember hearing Daddy say once, we chose Martin. I mean, if you think about it, all of those men and women who led the fight, they were all leaders. I mean, it kind of reminds you of the disciples. They were all leaders, they, they, but they, they knew 
you knew who the lead was, you know. He said, we, when we all came together, we were all teaching each other in Nashville, and then we meet Martin and Ab in, in Alabama, and he said, we knew who should lead us. And so um, Daddy always had that same respect and love for Martin. He, he knew that he was the chosen one to lead this fight. And, um, yeah, he did numerous uh, speeches and sermons about Martin King and writings um, because it was so important that, that everyone know that's who he was destined to be that person. Yeah. Yes, um, we've learned uh, so much recently about uh, the FBI monitoring and surveilling Dr. King, I just wonder if y'all have un uncovered any uh, evidence or if, have you requested the FBI file <laughs> on your dad? And, and I'm just interested in that uh, aspect I love the of question. It. I never thought to do that. But we lived that. I mean, he was always under surveillance. Mom always complained that the phones were, were um, bugged and uh, we didn't really care. Um, I mean, there was nothing, um, uh, yeah. <laughs> Nothing uh, that the FBI or the, the public didn't already know. Nothing going on, just calling your girlfriends. or Yeah, you know, um, my brother uh, tells a time in Chicago where he, uh, he said he got home early from school and nobody was there. And he said he looked up, and the, you'd have to see how the house was made, but he said he looked up, men were in the house. <laughs> they didn't see him moving pictures, you know, take, moving things around. And, and he said, oh my gosh, I think I won't go in. And turned out, you know, we assumed it was FBI. And we just laugh about it. Daddy had a funny story. He said, um, and he was moving from city to city every day. I mean, he'd just be in a different city, just a couple of cities a day sometimes. And... Um, he knew who was following him, and so he said uh, he decided to go home early one, one week, and uh, he said he walked over to the FBI guy and said, hey, I'm going home to Atlanta. Um, you can go home early, too, if you want to. Uh, I'll be there till Sunday, and said he, <laughs> he stood to me, said they thought it was funny. He was just letting the guy know, look, there's no reason. I'm just going home. You know, you can go if you want. So... Yeah, they were, they were normally under surveillance, and Mom really uh, worried about being followed uh, during the day. And the funny thing is, what were you looking for? I mean, it, it just didn't even make any sense. Um, and nothing ever came of it, so I assumed there was nothing to find. Yeah, except kids going to school and <laughs> making lunches. I don't know. Yeah. Hey, uh, Denise, um, I was wondering, um, was your father ever interested in electoral politics? Uh, did, was he involved in the election of Mayor Maynard Jackson as mayor? Well, no, he, Dad was never a politician, and he, um, he, you know, the people would come to him and ask him to support them, and I'm sure he supported Maynard, and I... Uh, Any time there was a mayoral election or something, he people would ask for his support, and he did support a few, you know, people off and on. But he just wasn't that person. Um, you know, it takes a certain personality to be in politics. And that wasn't his. I think his that's thing. one of the reasons. Excuse me, Denise. Yeah. I think that's one, of, and you mentioned this the other day. That's one of the reasons why he might not be as much of a household name as, as some of the yeah. others, like uh, John Lewis or Andy Young, yeah. who did go into politics. Yeah. He, uh, he chose to make his mark in, in, different, in different ways. Yeah, uh, yeah, he did. Daddy was a behind the scenes kind of person. Even at uh, SELC, he was director of, affili of affiliates. He, he went in before the marches. I mean, yes, he led a few, but he would go into the cities weeks before and prep the ministers and the churches and the, you know, the other local activists. And so this, you know, Martin's coming in on such and such a day. This is the route we're going to take. This, he was a planning guy. In fact, that makes sense. He was a planner. He, he was a designer. He, he envisioned things. So uh, he really was not the person in front of the press, and that was fine with him. 
uh, they actually relied yeah. on him to decide yeah. whether or not they should go to a different place. Yeah. They'd send him to Selma or St. Augustine and, and see, ask him to determine whether that was a, a, a place yeah. that was right for uh, SCLC right. involvement. Yeah, that's, so he, he really was the guy in advance, and he was the strategist. Um, I got a funny story about St. Augustine, though. Um, the, the, uh, someone asked me this morning um, about when did, uh, uh, about Daddy lo possibly losing his life, and uh, the, where did he possibly lose his life? And um, one, of course, was parchment that you described when a gun was put in his mouth, but... Um, to hear Daddy tell it, the one time he thought he was about to die, and that wasn't it. He was in St. Augustine, and they were opening up the beaches. And so blacks are, you can find the, the film on it, and blacks are marching out onto the beach in their bathing suits. <laughs> and um, the police came out, and the crowds on the beach were furious that black people were on the beach and started beating them up. And Daddy said, I think he was standing next to, I don't know, if, I don't know who he was standing next to, uh, one of the co-workers and said, can you, can you swim? The guy is in the SCT, can you swim? And they're looking out over the ocean and knowing they're about to go in, they said, not that well. And so they get out there and somebody's holding daddy down under the water and he said, I, th I said to myself, well, I guess this is where I, I ended. He thought he was about to die and he said, all of a sudden he, he popped up, dad popped up out of the water, a, a sheriff had knocked the person off of him and of course arrested daddy. But he said right. he was just so grateful that he, he came out alive. He said that's when he thought he was about to, to die. Oddly enough, I wouldn't have thought that would have been the city, but um, yeah. yeah. I think that was Fred Shuttlesworth, actually. You know, it that, might have been. He was in the water. <laughs> and it was like he asked, he asked uh, your dad if, if he could uh, swim, and he said, not in the ocean as well. Yeah, that, yeah. I've, swum in, I've swum in pools. <laughs> So, um, you know, it's funny now, but the, but when you realize the, the the danger that your dad and all these folks were were always in, from freedom rides to what you described in uh, St. Augustine and in in Selma, he was beaten in in jail after uh, the same day or the day after the video that. Uh, we saw that uh, began this uh, presentation. It was uh, part of the process. I mean, imagine John Lewis. I think, wasn't he beaten uh, some maybe 15 times or something? Yeah. Maybe more than that. I mean, he just yeah. kept coming. He just wouldn't, wouldn't stop. And, and speaking about, you know, one reason Daddy wasn't as well known, well, there were hundreds of men and women in the movement who were not well known. I mean, hundreds of them. Uh, and that's what we were saying. A lot of those who rose to major prominence went into politics afterwards. So their names were up, out, out in the public. Uh, but uh, they all sacrificed and, and um, uh, jeopardized their lives. It was not uncommon. I think one, one thing is that, that a lot of people in important positions uh, in, in trying to affect change did know and had such high regard for for your dad and we have the story in in the book about uh, then candidate Obama in 2007 at Brown Chapel in Selma where so many of the marches were launched including the, the Bloody Sunday March and candidate Obama has been given a list of of people by his staff that he should recognize uh, in uh, in his talk and say, oh, there's so-and-so, there's so-and-so. And your dad's name wasn't on the list, but your dad was there kind of unobtrusively sitting in the back or the middle of the, uh, the congregation. And Obama looks over the crowd and says, there's another person here uh, we wouldn't be here if it weren't for him. There wouldn't have been a voting rights if it weren't if it weren't for him. That's Dr. C. T. Vivian, and uh, your dad was was in his 80s and uh, just had just snuck in there and wasn't expecting any 
spotlight, and but Obama was so appreciative of, of what he had done. Yeah, and for us, being the kids, we were shocked Obama knew who he was. You know? <laughs> it's like, you know who he is. It's quite amazing. So, uh, and so many of the people of the movement weren't publicly known. Um, and Daddy was publicly known, but only within certain circles. And, uh, and it was the same with Hosea Williams and, you know, just so many others. Um, Fannie Lou Hamer, I mean, she certainly knew her locally, and her name would, would appear in books, but so many people wouldn't know her uh, otherwise, and, you know, on a national level. But uh, Zanana Clayton would be another one. I mean, they're just endless names. Um, so um, the movement just produced a lot of leaders uh, who sacrificed a lot and um, gained a lot of freedoms, you know, for us all, really. For everybody. That seems like a good note. Thank you all for being a part of this. We have copies of the book, It's in the Action, Memories of a Nonviolent Warrior, written by Reverend C.T. Vivian with Steve Pfeiffer. Um, join us next week for History's Lunch when Reverend C.J. Rhodes will be here to talk about the history and the future of Mount Helm Baptist Church. But for now, cool. help me thank Denise Morris and Steve Pfeiffer for this program today. Thank you. Thank you.